The Noble Butcher, written and narrated by Isao Kasua. 1. The night sky was dotted with countless clouds. Gree watched as a large cluster approached the moon. He forced his lethargic legs to stand. His entire body ached and his joints audibly creaked. He rolled up his yellow parchment list of lords and ladies of the region. Half of the names had already been crossed off. Reaching down to his side, he popped open a shallow metal tin labeled Quick in sloppy writing. He scooped his finger through the thick black gel and packed it into his cheek. Gree's tongue recoiled from the dry, smoky taste. As it coated his mouth, it agitated his gums and blackened his teeth. Gree's eyes relaxed. The tension dropped from his shoulders and his senses sharpened. He could smell the polish they used on the walls. Gree's overworked muscles replenished. A warm buzz replaced the soreness of his body. The clouds had finally covered the moon. Let's get started. Gree dashed towards Keep Gallfield. The keep, surrounding walls, and paved roads had been laid with a reflective white marble. The entire structure, which usually radiated a faint glow from the reflected moonlight, was dim. Each one of Gree's steps sounded like a discordant wind chime. Metal hooks and various barbed implements dangled on ropes just below his knees. From a distance, one might mistake Gree's sharp outfit for a kilt. He tilted his neck from side to side. Several creaks popped both times. His head and face were covered with a dark hood. His body was wrapped in tight, dark leathers. He snorted and hacked a black ball of congealed mucus onto the pristine stone ground. The stain it left bothered Gree. He hated leaving messes, even if they happened to be on Lord Gallfield's tax-paved marble paths. His gaze went upwards. There were tiny sockets in the battlements, seemingly arrow slits. That should do. With the thrust of his hip, one of the ropes flew up and landed in his hand. After winding it up, he threw the hook straight into the hole. He tested the rope, then scaled the wall. Halfway up, the white marble began to glow. Gree's eyes shot to the sky. The clouds had passed faster than he had calculated, but Gree had accounted for this. No guard should be on the wall for a few more minutes. Even still, this isn't good. Gallfield's men patrol the perimeter 24-7. Stop right there! A voice yelled out from below him. It was a guard. The young man was skinny and didn't quite fit his armor. Hollow clangs sounded as he ran over. Gree gritted his teeth, but then relaxed as he swallowed some of his quick. He unraveled two hooks that were much longer than his others and sent one rocketing at the guard. The guard raised his arm in defense. The rope wrapped around his forearm and gutted his gauntlet with an ear-piercing screech. The guard yelped, Back up, I knees! Before the man could finish his sentence, Gree yanked him forward with his rope. Taking his second hook, Gree whirled it into the air and threw it at a horizontal angle. The man tried to raise his other arm, but as he did, Gree whipped the rope that was already latched onto him, and the man fell to his knees. The second rope wrapped around the guard's neck. A pull, a snap, and that was that for the guard. Gree dragged the man up the wall with him. Blood trickled from the man's wounds. Gurgles periodically sounded from him as his life exited his body. Gree pulled himself from the body the rest of the way up and landed on the battlements. Retrieving his quick, he uncapped it and scooped more into his lip. His gums pulsed with an aching pain, but the drug did its job and calmed his nerves. No guards were posted on the wall, just as Gree planned, right at the shift change. The sound of metal boots was coming up from one of the stairways that led up to the top of the wall. Uh, they must have heard him. Gree grabbed the body, ran to the inner courtyard side of the wall, and jumped off. He threw two more hooks behind him as he fell. They hooked onto the lipped edges of the wall, and his body bounced to a stop. Gree lowered the dead guard's corpse behind a large hedge, then turned back up towards the top of the wall. He couldn't see the second guard, but he heard his metal boots clang against the stone ground. Gree crept his way back up the wall. He watched the guard circle his way towards the spot where he had initially climbed up. Gree dropped back down and leaned back against his elastic ropes. Right as the ropes reached their limit, he leaned back forward, shot back up the wall, and pounced on the man. With whirling metal, he cut him down. Gree grabbed the second man and once again scaled down the courtyard side of the wall. He hid the second guard's body behind the same large hedge. He looked over their faces. 
Their features weren't refined, nor well-groomed. Seemingly common men. Gree took out a couple of coins and put them over the closed eyes of the guards. He gritted his teeth. Gree didn't know these two guards, not even in the foggiest sense. He looked over their faces once more, sure to imprint their visages permanently in his mind. Gree rose, feeling a tad bit heavier. Thinking his high was wearing off, he swallowed more of his quick. The weight remained. His eyes were locked on the men. It was as if their presence drew him to the ground. He was about to sink to his knees when he heard the clink of armor from the courtyard. Gree broke his gaze from the dead men and peeked around the large hedge. The courtyard was filled with an assortment of animal-shaped hedges. He saw two more lightly armored men taking their rounds in the courtyard. One walked down the central pebbled path while the other walked the perimeter of the space along the wall. Neither were near him. He reached a finger into his lip to blacken his finger, then circled three names at the top of the paper. Urin Gallfield, Surti Gallfield, and Usar Gallfield. Urin and Surti were the recently crowned Lord and Lady of the country. Urin's father, Lyrius, passed away three years ago. Urin was the firstborn son of seven, and thus power was passed on to him. Strangely enough, not many knew of Urin before he was crowned. Rumors spread that he was a recluse, or perhaps even an illegitimate child of the previous lord. Regardless of his legitimacy, Gree was going to have a little chat with the new lord, as he had done with many of the other lords. These chats never ended well. For the lords, anyway, at least. His initial assault on the lower lords were just a show of force. He wanted to prove that he was serious about the liberation of the common people from their tyrannical overlords. Depending on how Lord Gallfield answered him, Gree would either continue his onslaught or return to obscurity. Gree spat into a fox-shaped hedge, then darted forward between other animal-shaped hedges. He assessed the white keep for any entry points. Jutting out of the roof, Gree saw a chimney. No smoke. Not yet, anyways. He circled around the back side of the keep and hooked one of his ropes into the gutters. He waited for another grouping of clouds to cover the moon, then climbed his way up to the roof. The inside of the chimney was pitch black. He spit down the shaft. After a moment, a splash of water sounded. Gree tied off his hooks to his belt and slid down the chimney. The grimy, soot-covered walls blackened his already sweat and dirt-drenched leathers. Gree put a hand over his face covering to stop from inhaling any of the ashy particles. Sweat precipitated on his face and back as something below him grew warmer. He was already most of the way down. Great. He shifted around to face the bottom of the chimney. It seemed that someone had lit the fire. There was a pot of water over the flames. Gree swallowed more of his quick, then untied two of his hooks and stabbed them into the walls on either side of him. He untied a third one and lowered it onto the pot's handle. He pulled it towards the inside of the fireplace. The water poured out and extinguished the fire. Smoke billowed up the chimney. Gree unlatched the hooks from the wall and dropped to the bottom. Wood, ash, charcoal-blackened water, and cinders flew into the air from his impact. He dashed forward into the chamber. There was a rotund man dressed in all white with a tall white chef's hat. Without a moment's notice... Gree dashed forward and threw a rope with several weighted balls at the end. It wrapped around the man's legs and he tumbled to the ground. Before the chef could speak, Gree put a gnarled hook to his neck. Where are Lord and Lady Gallfield? He snarled. The chef groaned. Quiet. Gree put the hook closer to his neck. The chef let out a suppressed yelp. Where are Lord and Lady Gallfield? Gree got on top of the man and pressed his knee into a substantial gut. The chef was shaking. Who are you? What do you want? He said. Where is your lord? Gree pulled his rope tighter. The chef grunted in pain. No, I won't say anything, the chef said. Gree pressed the dull side of the hook into the man's neck. Tell me. Gree pressed harder. Uh, I refuse. I won't let you near him, the chef said. Gree lessened his grip. He couldn't understand why this seemingly common chef would protect his lord with his life. Why? Why what? Why would you sacrifice your life to a nobleman like him? He's the reason people like us suffer. 
You're wrong. He's a great man. He has done nothing but help people like me. Though the man's body shook, his eyes lit with a reverence Gree had never seen before. Gree scowled. Who is this Lord Garfield? Well, I'll just have to see how great he is myself. In one fluid motion, he flipped the man over and struck him on the back of the neck. His body went limp. Gree dragged the unconscious man's body and hid it behind several sacks of potatoes. The kitchen was extravagant. A multi-burner wood-fired stove stood in the far corner. Exotic spices hung from the walls. All of the pots and pans were silvered. In the corner of the room, next to the sacks of flour, potatoes, and various other grains, was a deep water basin, a tray of sandwiches laid on an island across from the basin. He looked back at the chef and back at the sandwiches. I have an idea. 2. Gree managed to fit in the chef's outfit. Luckily, the chef looked to have enjoyed his own cooking, so the clothes cleanly hid his bulky leathers and hooks. He walked over to the water basin and washed his hands and face. He looked over at the chef. He was clean-shaven. Gree looked at his stubbled face in the reflection of the water. He put a hand into his mouth and retrieved his chewing quick. He grunted in dissatisfaction. Looks like these will have to go. With a kitchen knife in hand, he shaved off his facial hair. He nodded in approval. I don't look half bad, clean-shaven. Gree threw the congealed ball of black tar into the fireplace and rinsed his mouth with the basin water. Putting the knife down, Gree grabbed the tray of sandwiches that the real chef had already prepared. He exited the room into a hallway. His eyes strained from the obnoxious amount of red furniture. The space was lavishly decorated. There were paintings all around the house, mostly of the Lord and Lady and Honorable Usar. They were a young, attractive couple, hardly thirty. Their faces shone with great joy in the paintings. Gray stopped at one where the family was sitting in a meadow of yellow flowers. The painting was signed by a well-renowned artist, Adagio Rousseau. The frame had an ivy-designed, pure gold frame. By Gris' estimations, it must have cost them tens of golds, more than an entire farm could hope to make in an entire year. He looked around. There were several more of these exuberant paintings. <sighs> Great man, huh? He does a better job picking his paintings than running his country. I don't much like the paintings either, a woman's voice said from down the hall. She had brownish, almost red hair, and was dressed in a black and white maid's outfit. She walked with a slight limp. Each step had a hollow sound to it. A wooden foot? Well, I wouldn't say I dislike them, Grease said, trying his best to mimic the chef's voice. Come on, you don't have to pretend. The expression on your face said it all, the woman smiled. Oh, forgive my bad manners. Good evening. You're... Klaus, correct? She furrowed her brow and broke eye contact. Apologies, I'm still learning everyone's names. She stopped. Her right shoulder, the side with the wooden foot, was a little lower than the other. Gree waved his hand. It's all right. To be honest, I don't quite remember your name either. Nice to meet you again, madam. Gree trailed off with his hand extended. She tucked her chin and smiled at Gree. Corinna. She took his hand a beat longer than Gree was comfortable with. So, Klaus, what brings you out of the kitchen? Ah, the Lord requested I make him some sandwiches. But I must admit, I forgot where he wanted me to bring them, Gree said. Hmm, that's strange. He usually has a maid bring him his food, Corinna said. Gree felt his stomach lurch. Shit. Oh, well, uh, that's because he wished to talk to me over a meal. You know how he's been lately. Perhaps he wants a change in diet. Ah, oh, yes. He has mentioned wanting to lose some weight. Well, if you must know, I brought the Lord and Lady T not too long ago in their chambers. She pointed to a red door at the end of the hall. Thank you, Madam Corinna. You're truly a lifesaver. Gree felt himself smile at the tiny maid. She smiled back. He felt his nerves kick back in. He wasn't sure if it came from Corinna's presence or the fact he wasn't really Klaus. Well, I really should be going. Have a pleasant evening, Madam Corinna, and thank you again, Grease said. To you as well, Klaus, she said and brushed past him. Gree exhaled. He caught a lucky break. Things rarely went this smoothly for him. 
He reached the red door, turned the knob, and entered the room. It was a lounge. No one was in the room. Red-colored furniture sat around a hearth. In front of the couch, there was a low-to-the-ground table whose legs were designed like that of a goat's hooves. On closer inspection, Gree saw that the legs of the table, as well as the rest of the furniture's legs, were made of goat's hooves. He scoffed once more at the gaudy design of the Gallfield estate. Shaking his head, he looked around. The only door was at the top of a set of stairs in the left corner of the room. He crossed the room and ascended the stairs. Gree put his ear to the door. He heard muffled laughter from several people. A child. A man. And... A woman. This is it. Gree loosened his hooks before entering. He turned the handle to the door slowly. The door creaked open. Uh, excuse the intrusion, Lord and Lady Gallfield. Your dinner is ready, he said from the door. After a moment, a door in the corner of the room opened. Ah, oh, Klaus, thank you, a man's voice said, presumably Lord Urin Gallfield. He was a fine-looking young man who looked as jolly as he was in the paintings. His light brown hair bounced with each step. His face was angular and well-proportioned. A huge smile went across his face. He clapped a hand on Gree's shoulder. Thank you, my good man. I don't know what I'd do without you, he said warmly at him. Gree felt an overwhelming comfortability fall over him. This man who he plotted to kill seemed nice. Well, he's charismatic at least. Lord Gallfield looked at Gree's face. Klaus, have you been training with the guards? You look quite good. Your jaw is a bit more defined than when I last saw you. Perhaps you could show me some exercises one of these days. He pulled at a small amount of fat on his cheek. It seems I've gotten a little soft since Surti and I gained control of the Gallfield estate. What do you say? Gray was stunned for a moment, then realized his silence. Ah, yes, of course, my lord. That sounds quite agreeable. Very good, Klaus. Perhaps we could talk later. I apologize for cutting this conversation short, but I must be returning to Surti and Usar. Thank you again for this wonderful meal. It looks great. The Lord turned. Wait! Gree took a step forward. I have to say something to stop him. Think. Think. The Lord stopped and turned back. Yes, Klaus, what is it? If I may be so presumptuous, may I ask you about politics? Oh, I had no idea you had an interest in the matter, of course. What is it you would like to know? Excitement sparked off of him. He placed down the tray of sandwiches on a dark oak dresser. Gree was taken aback by the sudden burst of enthusiasm. Well, I... Uh, he scratched his face and recomposed himself. The staff and I have been talking. We've heard of how some of the lords have been treating their subjects. It isn't right. What do you mean? I've heard nothing but good reports. He looked off for a moment. Well, that's not exactly true. It appears some of my subordinate lords have been killed out of the blue. It's quite strange. I haven't heard of any discord from the people, Lord Gallfield said. He doesn't know. Or does he? Have you not heard of the massacre at Lady Diane's estate? Massacre? The Lord said. It happened not but a fortnight ago. It was ordered by the lady herself. You mean Margaret? He frowned and put a hand to his chin. Why, I spoke to her last week. The Lord leaned his weight on the dresser. He looked up. When you spoke earlier, you said lords, as in multiple lords? I'm afraid so, my lord. There have been purgings at several plantations across your land. The Lord nodded, his face grimaced. I will look into this immediately. I hope you understand I can't just take your word at face value. Hearsay can greatly exaggerate the truth. I just hope that's the case here. He put a hand on Grease's shoulder. Thank you for bringing this to my attention, Klaus. You're a good chef, but an even greater man. The Lord turned, picked up the sandwich tray, and returned to the corner door. Gray heard laughter from the Honorable Usar and Surti as Lord Gallfield returned. Gray turned and walked down the stairs with a feeling of weightlessness. Lord Gallfield, huh? Perhaps Klaus had a good reason to hold him in such high regard. Gree continued down the stairs and walked idly past the paintings. Their intricate designs didn't bother him as much. 
In fact, Gree took a small amount of appreciation in examining their craftsmanship. When he reached the kitchen door, he saw that it was open. His nerves immediately returned to him. He scooped a bit of quick into his mouth. His eyes grew sharp once more. From under his chef's disguise, he unfastened his hooks. Gray heard metal clanging footsteps from either side of him. From out of various doors and stairways, guards rushed out. Behind them stood the chef, in nothing but his undergarments. That's him! The real Klaus shrieked from one end of the hall. Without a moment's hesitation, the guards were upon him. Gray ripped off the chef's uniform. He spun and attempted to unleash his metal hooks. As they flew out, the hooks clanged against the narrow passageway. Damn, it's too tight. A guard took a swipe with his short sword. Gree kicked off the wall to avoid the attack and landed on top of him. The guard fell with a crash. Gree quickly picked up the sword and dashed forward at the next guard. The man before him was impressive in build. He stood nearly a head taller than the rest, possibly the captain of the guard. He blocked Gree's first blow with his shield. While Gree recoiled, someone tackled him from behind. In mere moments, he was tied up and over the shoulder of the shield-wielding guard captain. 3. Gree skidded on the damp ground of the dungeon. Your fate will be decided later, the burly armored men, seemingly the guard captains, said. Gree rushed forward at the open door of the cell. The man slammed it in his face. Disgraceful. He spit at Gree's feet and walked off. The cold ground numbed his feet. They took everything. His weapons, his cloak, and even his shoes. Gree spit more of his black spit, which had a bit of blood mixed in, on the dungeon floor. Even the dankest part of the keep was made of white marble. Moonlight filtered through the barred windows and onto the white floors, which lit the chamber in a dim light. The window looked out onto the hedged courtyard. A twinge of pain ran down to the root of one of Gree's gums. He reached where the pain was and pulled out the quick. The dark ball of mush slowly melted in his hand. Gree looked at it with disdain. He hated the bitter taste, but it was the only thing discreet enough that helped him with his nerves. He lightly pushed his blackened gums with his tongue. They were sensitive to the touch. The moonlight formed a barred box shape that trapped his silhouette. His acrid spit sat inside the box next to his shadow. The dark spot ruined the perfectly pristine and white image of the floor. Gree knelt down and mops up the spit with his tunic. It wasn't completely clean, but upon a passing glance, it would hardly be noticeable. The black ball of dip began to dry and stick to his hand. He looked down at it, then back at the window. Gree tossed the ball out into the grass of the courtyard. He exhaled and slumped his back to the wall of the chamber. He figured, due to his hooks and the hit list he had on him, there was no doubt of his guilt for killing half of Gallfield's sublords. Now all he had to do was await the inevitable. Though his mission was incomplete, Gree felt confident that he made some sort of impact for the common people. The door of the dungeon opened. Gree perked his head up. Escorted by four guards, Lord Gallfield stood before the cell. Gree looked at the floor, not budging an inch. Greetings, Lord Gallfield said. Gree slumped further into the shadows of his cell. One of the guards, the same captain as before, removed his helmet. A look of disdain was painted on his face. You will stand before his majesty, you murderous c Lord Gallfield put his hand up. At ease, Captain Cree, he said. If I might have a moment alone with the prisoner. Why, of course, my lord. The four knights bowed and exited the chamber. Hello again, Klaus. Though I suppose you aren't really Klaus, are you? Cree looked up. He expected a look of hatred or at least of aristocratic smugness. But the man had an earnest look on his face. Gree shook his head. No, I'm not. I apologize for deceiving you, but He cut himself off before saying my lord. Might I know your name? The lord sat down. They were eye to eye. Gree. Well, Gree, it's a pleasure to officially meet you. Lord Gallfield pulled a familiar piece of rolled parchment from his breast pocket. Though, based on this list of names and your... hooked implements... I suppose that that sentiment might not be reciprocated. Gray smirked. Oh, that's not exactly true. I didn't kill you, did I? I suppose that's true. Thank you for that, Lord Gallfield said with a slight bow. 
Would I be correct in assuming that you are the figure known as the Noble Butcher? Gray nodded slowly. Yes, Schofield, that is me. Though that isn't a name of my choosing, it is quite fitting. I used to be a butcher of cattle not too long ago. I had my own deli. That is until one of your father's sublords kicked me out of my property. Gree wet his dry lips. His mouth still tasted of quick. Lord Gallfield's eyebrows twitched at the mention of his father. Go on. There was a hint of skepticism in his voice. Gree stood and spit the remainder of the black liquid in his mouth out of the barred window. They levied a foreigner's tariff on the products I sold. They claimed since I wasn't a citizen of the realm that the property I owned wasn't technically a part of the realm. At first, it wasn't too much. I could handle a bit of aristocratic bullying and still make it. Lord Gallfield snorted. <laughs> That's a ridiculous claim. Foreigners' tariffs on a local business? Gray raised an eyebrow. A ridiculous claim for a ridiculous lord. That wasn't the only thing. They then started taxing those who bought my products with an importing fee. Needless to say, that drained me of all my customers. And that was that for my deli. Gree said. Unbelievable. You should have taken him to court. Surely the judges would have prosecuted that obvious abuse of power, Gallfield said. Gree sat back down, his silhouette still in the shadows of the barred window. With what money? Against a jury of his friends? Against bribed judges? Maybe if I had the money you had, Lord Gallfield. But for me, there was never a chance. Who did you say this lord was? If a fraction of your claim is true, then that lord should be evicted of his power, the lord said. That won't be necessary. Check the first name on my list. Gallfield pulled the parchment out again. Lord Ignostad. Yes, I remember this. It was three years ago. Father was on his deathbed when Ignostad was killed. It's been that long, Grease said. Time flies, huh? Lord Gallfield shot a fierce glance at Gree. He brushed a hand through his hair, then took a deep breath. So, how did you do it? Ignostad had one of the most defensible keeps in the country. His high walls were impenetrable. Nothing a little bit of creativity couldn't beat. Have you ever been to a butcher before, Lord Gallfield? The Lord shook his head. Well, when drying meats, we hang them on hooks. One day, I was looking around my drying room for any scraps I had missed found an aged flank steak. Ignostad had drained me of every coin I owned. That steak was like an entire vault of gold to me. I ripped it off the hook and devoured it. In my haste, I cut my hand pretty bad. Gree held up his left hand. There was a diagonal slashed scar across the center. Its pink smooth texture protruded from the palm. I looked at the sharp hook gave me an idea on how to breach his high walls. I'm sure you can see where my mind went. The Lord nodded. You scaled the wall. And then... He grimaced. I killed him, Grease said and grinned. The look of astonishment on his face when the poor butcher came crawling through his window was priceless. He tried to offer me all sorts of compensation, but I was hungry. Starved. Not for money, though. None of the gold in the world could have turned me back. He looked at Gallfield's face for a negative reaction. Gree loved disturbing aristocrats. Instead, the man had a hand on his chin, his brow furrowed. He was deep in thought. Who the hell is this guy? I think I can understand that feeling, Gallfield said. You were pushed to your wit's end. <laughs> Gray laughed. Don't act like you can ever come close to understanding what I've been through. How could you, Lord Gallfield? You inherited your wealth, the estate, your power, your land. Everything you have was given to you. Gree stood up and walked to the edge of the cell where Lord Gallfield sat. Gallfield remained where he was. I was abandoned here as a kid. I learned the language of this god's damned realm. Day in and day out, I worked to establish myself as a reliable man. And for what? For some noble prick to go on a power trip and play with my life like I'm some sort of fucking chess piece? Oh, and you think you understand? <laughs> Bullshit, you do. You're all the same. 
treating people like me as trash until I'm right on your doorstep. Then, <laughs> knock knock. Suddenly, when I have the power, you start your bootlicking and begging. Where was the forgiveness when I was starving? Where was the forgiveness for the hundreds they put to death with their taxation and outright massacre? Explain to me that, Lord Gallfield. Explain to me why aristocrats like you go on crushing people like me. Neither spoke for what felt like minutes. Gallfield broke the silence. I'm sorry, Gray. I was aware of the corruption, but not to the extent that you've described. But that's exactly what I'm trying to fix. My father may not have been the wisest man, and he may not have put the right people in power. But I vowed to atone for his sins. The past three years, I've been building up my wealth and devising a plan to vet my father's chosen sublords. With expensive paintings and marble keeps? Gree scoffed. Both my father's choice before he died. Gallfield shifted from side to side and broke eye contact. I was actually raised by my mother. She was a common woman, one of the maids. So I was raised solely by her off the Gallfield estate. I wasn't recognized as his first son until he was close to death. He was fond of my mother and wanted her son to rule. Gree stood silent. How about that? The rumors were right. He's a mutt. The Lord continued. That being said, you have killed many people, Gree, not just noblemen. Those two guards you killed, Pater and Terran, they had families. They were not nobility of any kind. They were honest, hard-working men just like you. How should you answer for your crimes? Those men didn't deserve to die. I accept any sentence you give me to pay for their deaths. Gree hung his head. Well, if that's the case, Gallfield said, I want you to serve as my enforcer, to ensure that my retainers stay in line and that nothing like what happened to you happens to anyone else ever again. We can right a wrong here. We can do something good out of this tragedy. With your skills, you can make a difference, Gree. The Lord nodded. What do you say? He reached a hand into the cell. Gree stood and looked into the Lord's eyes. He read no hostility in them. A radiating warm energy filled Gree from the Lord's determined look, one like he had never felt before. Things would be better if he joined this man, he thought. But deep in his gut, he felt something else. Something cold, something bitter dragged him down. The feeling rose up in his throat and into his mouth, through his gums. The taste of quick, his mouth pulsed with dull pain. Gree gritted his teeth. A reoccurring thought appeared once more. Who the hell is this guy? Gree answered the question in his head. Someone with the potential to change things. Well? Lord Gallfield continued to stare into Gree's eyes. Gree walked to the back of the chamber. Looking out the window, he saw the sun beginning to rise. Its rays felt nice on his face. The bitter liquid gathered in his mouth. Gree looked back at the Lord, whose hand still hung through the bars of the cell. He exhaled and spit the last of his bitter liquid out of the window. His legs shook as he walked over to the Lord. Fine. We'll see how this goes, Lord Gallfield. Gree took the man's hand. Gallfield's expression lit up. His face turned to a pleasant smile. Guards, bring me the key to the cell. I'm freeing the prisoner, Gallfield yelled. The four men returned to the room. Are you sure, my lord? said Captain Cree. Yes, I am, Captain. We have a new ally. He held out his hand to the captain. Cree hesitated for a moment, then quickly fumbled the keys off of the key ring into Lord Gallfield's hand. He turned the key into the cell's lock and opened the door. Gree looked back at the cell. His silhouette was no longer behind the shadowed bars. Well, come on then, Gree. We have work to do. He walked forward and turned to the captain. I need you to bring Master Gree his weapons and clothes. He turned to a different guard. You, wake Klaus and tell him to fetch us an early breakfast. The rest of you, get some rest. <sighs> Thank you for your service. Right away, my lord. The guards saluted and went off to do their assigned tasks. Gree walked beside Gallfield. <sighs> Order me like that. I might have to cross your name off my list after all. Gallfield chuckled. <laughs> Knowing you, you'd probably fulfill that promise. Gree smirked. In a heartbeat. Both men ascended from the dungeon. Four. After bathing and getting Gree's soot-riddled leathers and clothes washed, the two men reconvened in Gallfield's study. 
Over a warm meal, they discussed Gree's first mission to investigate the supposed massacres ordered by Lady Diane. Gallfield slid a crest with an intricate design across the central table. The crest depicted a fox's head peeking over a shield, its tail curled in front. Gree slurped a mouthful of buttery tomato soup. He wiped his mouth and placed the bowl down. What's that? It's the family crest of the Gallfields, who are originally rabbit and game hunters, hence the fox iconography. It marks you as one of my enforcers. Show this to Lady Diane once you find solid evidence of her wrongdoings. She'll understand what it means. Hopefully, that's all you'll have to do, Gallfield said. Gree took the crest. What do you mean by solid evidence? The Lord thought for a moment. Documents, dead bodies, letters of correspondence with unsavory individuals, testimony from multiple guards, or anything that might otherwise expose what she's done, Gallfield said. Gray nodded. I see. He finished the remainder of his soup. When shall I depart? Whenever you feel prepared. Feel free to rest for as long as you need. Gray stood up. I think I'll go now. I don't think your guards will like it if I stick around too much. Considering, well, he paused, what I did to their friends. Gray linked his fingers and stretched his arms behind his back. His entire spine popped. I see. That might be for the best, at least for a time, Gallfield said with a slight look of remorse on his face. Very well, Master Gree. Happy hunting. Gree smiled and exited with a nod. Shouldn't take me more than a week. See you soon, Gallfield. Each one of his steps clinked with the sound of his hooks. The footfalls from his steel-capped boots resonated and sent vibrations through the wooden floors of the keep. He began down the stairs when he heard a door open. Would you quiet down? Some of us have to work in a couple of hours. Gree recognized this as Karina's voice. He froze, unsure of what to say. His legs quaked. His hands shook. In his three years of hunting noblemen, he had never experienced such nerves around any other person. He reached to find his quick, but stopped himself. No, I'm not using it for this. Without turning towards her, he spoke. Um, uh, apologies, Madam Corinna. I was just leaving. The short, reddish-brown-haired girl held a pillow in one hand. She wore a light blue nightgown that went down to her shins. Madam? No one calls me that. Except... She rubbed her eyes and jutted her neck at Gray. Klaus? Oh, wait. Or I guess, fake Klaus. Gree felt his mouth curl into a smile against his will. News travels fast, huh? It does. She pursed her lips. Is it true? She asked. Her expression hardened. Gree suspected she was talking about the two guards. He nodded slowly. She glared at Gree. Pater and Terran were good men. I hope Lord Gallfield is right about you. We'll just have to see if your lord's or apologies. Our lord's judgment was correct. I hope that one day, when we cleanse the corruption of this land, that it makes up, at least in part, for Pater and Terran's deaths. Gray walked down the stairs and exited the keep. The early morning sun rose above the trees of the surrounding forest. Gree stood outside of the front gates. He looked back at the Gallfield estate. There was a red stain on the otherwise white wall from where he dragged Pater's body. He stared at the red streak. His body felt numb. His eyebrow twitched and his jaw clenched. A pressure filled his chest. He opened his mouth as if to speak, but no words came out. His face contorted into a scowl, and he turned away from the wall. Not yet. Thank you for listening to this audio presentation of The Noble Butcher. Written and narrated by Isao Kashiwa. Owari.